right. Um, I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I want to read the first five verses today. 2 Timothy 4. We, we have been in 1 and 2 Timothy for the majority of this year. And, um, uh, and uh, it's still going to take us a few weeks to get through the, the end, because we're going to slow down here in chapter 4 and hit hit some specific parts of the passage that we're going to read this morning. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I solemnly charge you, there we go. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. In this, in this passage, there are five key elements to this text. Five key elements to this text. The first one is God, and he appears in the first verse in the context of the spiritual assessment. That is, that he is going to judge the living and the dead. So it's... it's uh, he is one of the five key elements as the one who is going to be involved in the spiritual assessment that all will face in the future. The second is Paul himself who is doing the writing. He is being a spiritual father for Timothy. He is charging Timothy. So there's Paul as a spiritual father. That means there's Timothy as a spiritual son. He's the third one here. There are some things said specifically to him. Uh, he's to be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill his ministry. And that's who Timothy was supposed to be. This is what he was charged to be. So there's Timothy as a spiritual son. The fourth part of this passage is the, are the people that are talked about in this passage. And, and what we see about them is a spiritual condition, that they will that they will have itching ears and not endure sound doctrine. It's their spiritual condition that is focused on. So God, spiritual assessment, Paul, spiritual father, Timothy, spiritual son, people, spiritual condition. And the last one is a need. It's a need. And that focuses on spiritual ministry. Preach the word. Preach the word. There's a spiritual ministry that is needed at this time. These are the five main elements in this passage. I want to consider, uh, I want to consider them probably one at a time. There might be one Sunday that I combine a couple of them, but I, I, my intention right now is to do them one at a time. Um, uh, I want to consider them one at a time, and the good news is we're not covering all five of them today, right? So, so that's good. Um, but I want to begin with the first one. I want to begin with the idea of a spiritual assessment as it's given to us in this, in this passage. The fact that God is revealed to us here as the judge of all, as the judge of all, okay? And I, I want to focus this morning on this idea of, of judgment, of judgment. What does it mean to judge? I want to focus on what it means that God is the judge. Uh, let's look at this together this morning. This passage focuses on God as the judge. So let's start there. What, what we're taught in Scripture is, first of all, that all of us are going to be judged by God. We all face a time in the future when we are going to be judged by God. Now, let me just give a little background that will, that will help set the stage for us. Uh, some of you, maybe many of you, will remember the story in Genesis 16. Um, Abraham, Sarah, can't have a child. She gives her, 
her servant girl to Abraham as a surrogate mother. Um, Hagar becomes pregnant with, uh, with Abraham's child. Sarah decides maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all. <laughs> She's not happy about this. And so she begins to treat Hagar harshly. And Hagar runs away. Hagar runs away. And, and she's, she's in the wilderness somewhere. She's found a well. She's sitting by a well. And the angel of the Lord appears to her and, and says a few things to her. He appears to her and he tells her that she has to go back to Sarah. She has to go back to her mistress and live under her. And you think to yourself, what a cruel thing for God to say. But he tells her a few other things. He says, this child that you're pregnant with uh, is, well, he's going to be a pretty unique man. Uh, he's going to be a wild man. There's going to be a lot of conflict surrounding this man. There's, there's, um, there's, uh, he's going to be against a lot of, against, and everyone's going to be against him. But I want you to name him Ishmael. His name is to be called Ishmael because Ishmael means God hears. God hears. Call him hears. Go back to Abraham and Sarah. So with this message and this name that, that has been given to her for her son, Ishmael, God hears. Now, mind you, this is in the context of her suffering under Sarah and fleeing. And the angel's very specific. He says, God has heard your affliction. God has heard your affliction. He's heard it. All right, let me just pause here for a second. How many of you have lots of questions to ask about why it is that God hears human affliction but doesn't always relieve it? I mean, that brings up questions. Not sure how to fully understand that. Okay? But what Scripture teaches us is that the afflictions that people go through are not because God is ignorant, unaware, or asleep on the job. He hears. He hears. Okay? So name your son Ishmael. Go back to Sarah. To the one who has afflicted you. Go back. God hears has heard your afflictions. So Hagar responds, sitting around this well, she, she responds, God has given me a name for my son. I'm going to give this place a name. I'm going to name this place. So she names that, that well, Beer Lahai Roy. And that means the living one who sees me. The living one who sees me. Okay? So what's the significance of this story? Well, there's probably any a number of things that we could look at, but when you think about what's going on in the story and the meanings of these two names, what you realize is that God has spoken to her and affirmed to her, even though I'm sending you back to this place, it's not because I have not heard your afflictions. I have heard them. I'm aware of what you're going through. And so she responds as a woman who had run away from this. And she realizes, I might be able to run away from Sarah, but I can't run away from God. God found me in this place. Nobody else might have known who I was or why I was here or what was going on in my life. But the God who hears me also sees me. And he met me in this place and he gave me an instruction the God who sees me. She names the place the living one who sees me. Now, I want to say it this way. When you stop and you think about the significance of these two names in this passage, Ishmael, God hears, Bir Lahai Roy, the living one who sees me, the first thing, uh, uh, the first thing that you realize is that these, these names that are given are all expressions of comfort. God hears and God sees. Now, please hear this. 
There's never a place in the Bible where the name is, is given to God, the God who explains. I wish. Okay? He doesn't explain everything. But here's the fact. In the midst of my afflictions, what I can say for certain is God sees and God hears. You know, it's hard. If I, could, if I can just say it this way, I think, I think the thing that we struggle with, when we come face to face with a certain amount of affliction and we're confronted with this truth that God both hears and sees us, we are in that moment granted the opportunity to bow and worship in a spirit of acceptance. Often what we humans do, though, is we kick against it. I want to know why, and I want to know what I can do to get out of it. I want to know why, and I want to know how to get out of this. You see, part of the truth of, of God's word that is so difficult for us is that God cares more about what he's doing in our lives and through our lives than about what he has to use to do what he wants to do in our lives and through our lives. Sometimes suffering, affliction, is a necessary part of what he's doing in us or through us. I don't always have an explanation for that. But I will tell you this. The ancients used to write a lot about what it means to come to a place of true heart submission and acceptance of the will of God. Boy, we human beings have a hard time with this. Boy, we fight with this. Boy, we wrestle with this. We anguish over it. If you want to know, uh, those of you that were in Sunday school, another reason why we live with so much anxiety in our lives, it's because we so often refuse to accept the reality of things that we have no control over, the things that we cannot change. We stress we anguish, we push, we try to make, we explain, because if I just say it differently, my spouse will finally get it, or my kids will, and we, and we push, and we push, and we push, and we, and we find our stomach churning, right? The gift of acceptance is profound. Now, listen, there's two sides to everything. How many of you know if there's something you can do to change some things, you better do it? But when it's truly something you can't, the gift of acceptance is one that we find in that place when we bow our hearts before God and we say, Thou, O God, are the God who sees and who hears. And this is where you have me, so you are on the hook to give me grace for this day. And God, you will. If you tell me I've got to go back to my mistress who has been afflicting me, then I have to trust that in this act of obedient worship before you, you will not fail me. You will not fail me. Amen? It's not easy. It's not easy. You're the God who sees, and you're the God who hears. This is what's going on. In this. It's, a, it's a word of comfort, but it's also a second thing. It's not just a word of comfort. It is also a word of this. Please hear this. It is a word of justice. Because it means that in the end, the God who sees and the God who hears is the God who also decides and who rewards. I see, I hear, and I've decided that you will go back. So do what I tell you to do. And Hagar, I have a future for you through your son. I have a future for you through your son. I see, I hear. Please, please understand this. This is the great framework through which we understand the judgment of God. God is the only one who is qualified ultimately to judge 
because he's the only one who has the ability to see and to hear it all. He's the only one. He sees and he hears. Therefore, he is qualified to decide and to reward. He's uniquely, he's uniquely qualified for that position. He decides and he rewards. When he asks you to go through difficulty and you go through it obediently, faithfully, I promise you, he will not fail to see it, nor will he fail to reward it. He will not. Because he is a just judge. He's right in everything he does. He's a God of justice. He's a God of justice. So that's first of all, just a little background to understand God as the judge. It's because he sees and because he hears. Secondly, God is the judge. Just say this very quickly. There's two great future judgments. The first one is what we refer to as the judgment seat of Christ. This is the one before which all believers will appear. And yes, those of us who are redeemed, we're saved, we're going to heaven. But Paul says we're going to also have to give an account for our lives. And there's going to be a reward, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. And then depending on what our lives are, there'll be a reward or there not be a reward. And we'll see what that's, that's like when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lives and our works are going to be evaluated and rewarded. So let me just say openly, that's why it matters how we live our lives. The, the choices that we make, the ways that we conduct ourselves, the things that we give ourselves to, the lives that we live matter because they're going to come under a time of evaluation. There they are going to appear before God who sees and who hears, and he's going to tally up the sum total of our lives. And he will reward accordingly. The second judgment is what we refer to as the great white throne judgment. This is the judgment that happens at the very end of time in which everyone is judged on the basis of two things. Two things. Everyone is judged on the basis of whether or not their names appear in the Lamb's book of life. That, that seals their eternal destination. And then we're told that the books were opened and their works were examined. So please hear this. I, I, I think most, most uh, Bible scholars would agree with this, that even for those who are lost, eternal judgment will be just. In other words, your next door neighbor doesn't have the same future that who's the great paragon of evil that we Hitler. Okay? You pick the worst person you can think of that did the most harm to the most people in their lives, and the reality is this. There may be a large number of people that are lost, eternally separated from God, but they will not all experience their lostness in the same way. That God is just, and that, that yes, they will be judged according to whether or not their names are in the Lamb's book of life, and yes, they will be judged according to their works as well. And what befalls them in their future will be befitting. Let me just pause here for a second and say, if your name's not in the Lamb's book of life, and you are eternally separated from God, your future will not be good. It may be less bad than someone else's, but it will not be the future that you want for yourself or that God wants for you. It will not be good. But God is not God who treats people all as if they were one, no matter what life they lived. The future judgment is going to be based upon the book of life and the works of the people who appear at the judgment seat there. So that's what it means, a little bit about what it means to be judged by God. That gives us a beginning. The second thing, oh, I forgot to click one more time. Even the lake of fire will be measured, moderated by human works, ways we don't fully understand. All right? The second thing we need to consider is not only the God who judges, but what it means for us to judge what we see. I want to take a moment on this one this morning. 
Um, what does it mean for us to judge what we see? I want to read two scriptures to you real quickly. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. And then I want to read from John real quickly. Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Listen to this. This is a Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge, lest you be judged. Do not judge, lest you be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Okay? Now compare that to what is said in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 24. John chapter 7, 24 says, whoops, that's 8. John 7, 24 says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Okay? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. This said against, do not judge, lest you be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. What do we do with these two scriptures side by side? Let me run through a list of, of things that I think we need to be aware of when we're thinking about what it means for us to judge what we see. Okay? Here's first of all. The first thing is, judging is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. That's why he warns us, judge not, lest you be judged. It's a very dangerous proposition to judge. Because the measure you use to judge is the measure that will be used to judge you. So you might want to be careful about this matter of judging. You might want to take it really seriously, right? It's a dangerous proposition. Why? Because it opens us up to judgment by the same measure. Now let me just say this really quickly. If you, if you wonder... How does being a judgmental person, how does being a judge open you up to judgment? Well, it does it in two ways. The, the first, the primary way is that what's, what we're being told here is that, that when we judge, the standard we use is the standard God's going to use to judge us. So the first way it's dangerous is because God will judge us by that same standard. But there's a second way. And, and this one is less obvious, and I'm not sure it's the direct intention of this, of this passage. But I think it's important to say it this way. Um, you get enough people that are all judging, you create a culture of judgment. And it becomes an amazing thing how the ones who started off doing the judging end up being the ones who are getting judged. Why? Because we all have a tendency to look around us and to see and then to decide what we think about what we see. The warning here, I believe, would be well suited to uh, a word that would encourage us to, to pre prevent the spirit from creeping into our hearts. God, I thank you that I'm not like so-and-so. I so thank you. I tithe, I do this, I do that. God, I thank you that I'm not like that wicked sinner, that tax collector over there. I'm, I thank you that I'm not like him. I mean, who wants to live there, right? Who wants to live in that kind of environment? So judging is a dangerous thing because it opens us up to judgment. The second thing is that our standard will be used with us. It will be used already. The third thing is that, that, please hear this, while God sees and hears all things, we don't. We don't. You and I don't see everything. And listen to this. And even the things that we do see are often seen incorrectly, not the full picture, or we get the wrong conclusions from it. We don't always see... We, we see, that's why we're warned, don't judge by the outward appearance. It's intended to communicate to us that what we think we see so clearly is not the way it is. So I remember this. I remember having this conversation, if it's okay for me to expose myself a little bit, this conversation, right? 
because I understood why there were times when I would be having a conversation with my wife and she would say to me, you're angry. And I would say, but I'm not really angry. And she would say, yeah, but your face looks angry and your tone sounds angry. And you know what? Uh, when you go around that, that tree a few times and you start saying to yourself, what is happening here? Why do we keep going around this tree? You start thinking to yourself, okay, let me step back and think about what's really going on here. And I remember in that process, God using her saying this to me to say, what is it that is going on inside of me that in the ways that I speak, I'm sounding angry and I'm looking angry. God, what is going on? And I had this moment of revelation. And I had to go back to my wife and say, listen, I know that I need to change the way I talk. That's on me. But it would be helpful to me if you understood something about me. When you hear me talk that way and you say, I'm angry, I acknowledge that you're right. That's how I sound. That's how I look. But that's not what's really going on inside of me. Here's what's going on inside of me. I get that way when two things are happening. When I'm hurt, I sound angry. But anger's up here. Hurt is what's underneath the surface. And the second thing is, when I feel powerless to do something, the feeling of powerlessness is a miserable feeling to me. When there's something that I just wish so badly I could do something to fix this, to help this, to solve this, and I can't do anything about it, the feeling of powerlessness comes out of me as a frustration that absolutely looks and sounds angry. But the anger is just the surface. It's the hurt and the powerlessness. And so if you can look beyond, please know that I recognize my responsibility to change the way I'm speaking. But if you could help me, either one, ignore the way I'm speaking and just hear he's hurt or he's feeling very powerless right now. Or maybe even remind me that that's what's going on inside of me so that I can maybe express myself more appropriately or deal with what's, what's really going on inside of me in a better way. That would be helpful. It's an illustration of the fact that what we see isn't always the way it is. It's not the way it always is. And sometimes we get stuck in that place of looking at the person across from us and saying, I can obviously see. I mean, anger's written all over you. How can you deny it? You know, often, by the way, often, not only do we not see correctly, but even the things that are going on inside of us, we don't even see them well. We human beings think we are so much smarter than we really are. We are just so much more certain than we really should be. We need to give ourselves and the people around us a break. We're all stu-nods working our way through it. Look it up. Right? We're not brilliant. We're figuring our way through this. We need to be careful because we don't see well. We don't see well. Now listen, the fourth thing is to mention here is that righteous judgment is a must. There is a way that we must judge. So... I gave you the scary stuff. Some of it, it's dangerous. Our standard will be used against us. We don't see well. And yet Jesus said we're supposed to judge righteous judgment. We're supposed to judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment is a must. In other words, we need to discern. We need to be a discerning people. So what do we do when we start putting these things together? I believe this one is important. I believe it's very valid. We ought to be judging things much more than we judge people. You know what? It is a lot easier to identify a sin than to identify what's going on inside of the person who commits the sin. Amen? You know, statistically, 
um, there are just certain sins that we could so easily pick on in Scripture that statistically are very tied to experiences that people have had in their past. When people are abused, they're hurt, they tend to, to act out later on in ways that are very sinful. We can see the sin and identify it as sin, but we do not have any clue how to judge it in that person. Only God knows why somebody is committing that sin just because they love the sin so much versus they're deeply wounded and have fallen into a habit that is destructive to them. That they might be laying in bed at night wishing they could desperately get out of. We're just not well qualified to make judgments on the people. We need, however, to discern the sin. We need to look at the sin and say, and that's not something that she, people should be living in. I should not be living in that. They should not be living in that. And then we stop. But I don't know why they're living in that. I don't know why they're living in that. You ever heard that phrase, hurt people hurt people? There's just so much truth to that. That people do things because of the things that have been done to them. There's a song that I became aware of some, some years ago. There's a line in it that has just struck me so forcefully. It's a song about redemption and God restoring broken people. And one of the lines talks about God healing us from the pain of things that have been done to us and the shame of the things that we have done to others. Such powerful truths. We need to be delivered from the shame of the things we've done and the pain of the things that have been done to us. Now, none of us want to develop a victim mentality, but here's just the reality. People go through things, and some people go through things that are just desperate and difficult and destructive enough that it leads to some really damaged parts in their lives. Can I just say this really quickly? Not for everybody, but sexuality is a place where very often damage plays out in people's lives. The last thing the world needs is a lot of Christians walking around stating the obvious. It's sinful. Nobody, nobody has to soften that. But what does need to be softened is the reason why people are walking in so much self-destructive brokenness. And I'll tell you this, God's people need to have compassion there. Judging things, not the people involved in the things. It's a significant, it's a significant truth to ponder. The sixth thing is this. When we compare these two scriptures... We have to know that there are several levels of judgment. There are several levels of judgment. The first one is preference. I just, I have preferences. They're personal. And I've got to admit, I get snobbish about some of them. I've joked around about some of them. I know where the best cannoli in the world comes from. And I will only eat that cannoli. Don't make me a cannoli. I don't want to disappoint you by telling you your cannoli is an inferior cannoli. Because I'm, I would, I'm not even sure I'd be able to admit it if your cannoli was better than Israel's cannoli. At this point, I'm so invested in Israel's Israel's cannoli as being the best that I, I, it would be like a, I'd have to repent and have a, go through a whole process to be able to admit how wrong I was. You know, The, the things we get so... so you know, we, get, we get into some things, and we get into them. You know, some of us are coffee snobs. Some of us are music snobs. Some of us are cannoli snobs. Some of us are whatever. You know, we're, we get into these things. Really, in the end, they're just preferences. I have to admit, there might be a cannoli from a shop in, in New York City that you'd like better than the ones I buy in Philadelphia. We might have to have a cannoli eating contest to try to settle the issue, but right? In the end, they're just preferences, if we're honest. The second one is convictions. And I believe that convictions are very, are, are, are most often, they are a combination of self-knowledge, Bible knowledge, willingness 
and then the Holy Spirit guiding us. Sometimes they're just rigid, rigid legalistic things. Sometimes they are. But I think most believers, it's like, I know myself. I know where I'm weak. I know where I don't have a long leash. I know enough of the Bible that warns me about the dangers of certain things. So I know me. I know the Bible. God, I'm willing. I want to live obediently before you. And so, Spirit of God, lead me into the way that I should live. And that becomes a very deep personal conviction for someone. But just remember that that is what it is. It's important. It's vital for you. But it might not be equally vital for somebody else. There might be somebody else that doesn't have the same Achilles heel that you have. Right? There are things, there are things that are, that are personal convictions for a reason. They're personal. They're me and my walk with God. And then, please hear this, and then there are absolutes that the Bible is just black and white about. Don't do this. And there's no personal conviction about well, I'm committing adultery, but I'm not convicted about it. Well, you better get convicted about it because you're living in sin. And your personal feeling about it has no, no significance to this, no relevance to the conversation. It's just, it's just sinful. Okay? So there's the black and white. We need, to, we need to approach these things with a fair degree of wisdom and understand what level we're dealing with, what level of judgment we're dealing with. All right. Last thing about judging what we see. James chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 have, have for years now been a very significant passage of Scripture to me. I want to read them to you. I, I, was, I was so deeply impressed by the significance of this. James 2 12 and 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. See, this is a restatement of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, The merciful will be shown mercy. It's a restatement of the words of Jesus that if, if the, the standard you use to judge is the standard that will be used to judge you. So you... This. I don't have time for verse 13, for, for verse 12, but verse 13, the essence of... Your future judgment before God could be either merciless, in which case you'll get exactly what you deserve, or it could be merciful in which case you'll get graded on a curve and you'll get a better grade than you deserved. And one of the key differences between whether you get mercilessness, which is what you deserve, or mercy is whether or not you showed mercy to the people around you during your lifetime. I just want to say it this way. If you tend to have a strong justice orientation that, that is black and white and merciless toward people too often. You need to duck. Duck. Because the warning of God's word is that that standard is coming right back at you. Because, listen, this is why, this is why we're warned about many being teachers, receiving a stricter judgment. It's the more accountability you have for the things you say you know. So, I mean, if you're just out there looking, you're going, man, I know this, and I know this, and that, and this, and th that, you better know that that's the way God's going to deal with you. And that's a scary proposition. It's a scary proposition. We need to know this about judging the things that we see. Here's what I close with. Oops, sorry. I just forget. Judgment can be merciless. Judgment can be tempered by mercy. And our judgment will be conditioned by how mercifully we have treated and judged and forgiven other people. 
So pick your judgment. Pick it carefully, right? Here's the last one. Boy, I, I, I have been looking forward to ending with this one. I need to preach this to myself. And there might be a few of you that need to preach this to yourselves this morning. What about judging ourselves? There's a scripture that, um, that I've, 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 well, it, at first it was so unfamiliar to me that I just kind of set it aside and said, eh, I don't know I can pay much attention to that one right now. And as the years have gone by, it, it's kept creeping up on me. It's like I, I can't, it just keeps sneaking up on me and I have to deal with it and say, okay, this has to mean something, right? Keep sneaking up on me. It's, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Listen to this. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. The King James reads faithful. But to me, it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or by any human court. In fact... I do not even examine myself. I do not even examine myself. Now listen to this. For I am conscious of nothing against myself. That is, my conscience is completely clear. I'm not aware of anything that I've done wrong. Yet I am not by this acquitted. The fact that I don't know it doesn't mean I haven't done something wrong. It doesn't mean I'm innocent. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the, hidden, the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. So I reflected on this passage. Here's the things that stand out to me that, 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 I, that, that we want to close with, that I want to close with this morning. These four things, real quickly to close with. The first one is, we are called to be faithful. All of us are. We're faithful. That is trustworthy. We're called to be faithful, trustworthy to what God shows us and tells us, to the gifts that he's given to us, to the opportunities he's given to us. We are called to be faithful in these things. This is what we are called to be. We're called to be faithful. Point number one. So for all those of us that are inclined to always find fault with ourselves and do better, let's just take this word and because this will be right up our alley. Yes, God, I got to be faithful. I'm going to be more faithful tomorrow than I was today. That'll preach to me, okay? Faithfulness. We're called to be faithful. That's just true. That's what God requires of us as his servants, to be faithful. That's verse three. Be faithful. The second thing in this passage is that being judged by others does matter, but only a little bit. Only a little bit. To me, it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you. He doesn't say it's insignificant. He doesn't say it's insignificant. But can I ask you, how many of you have found yourself at times in your life struggling under the weight of what other people think of you? Modifying your life, not because of anything God requires of you, only because of what others think of you. How many of you have found yourselves there? We do this under the weight of our parents' expectations. This is what my parents think life should be, so this is what I think life should be. I'm not encouraging small children to rebel against their parents, <laughs> by the way. I'm telling you that there come appropriate times when all of us have to step into adulthood and walk out our lives before God. We have a tendency to live under the expectation of everyone around us. Paul says it's a very small thing for me to be judged by you. It's a very small thing. He says what ultimately matters is that I'm going to be judged by God. That matters a whole lot. That matters a whole lot. The third thing that, he, that we see here is Paul saying, I'm not conscious of anything against myself, yet this doesn't mean I'm innocent. In other words, 
what we just said about not being good at judge, uh, judging others, we're not even good at judging ourselves. We're not even good at judging ourselves. How many times have I proclaimed my innocence when I'm not innocent? How many times I've felt guilty for things that God says that was forgiven so long ago, it's no longer against you. And I'm still, bring, I'm still living under it, right? We're just so bad at this, right? So Paul says, Paul says, I, I don't know of anything against myself, but that doesn't mean I'm innocent. We're just not good. We're just not good. Listen to this. Please hear this. We only know ourselves so well. Sometimes I know that there are some percentage of us that just don't pay attention to ourselves. We're not introspective at all. We're not self-reflective at all. And some of us need to, need to jump into that arena and maybe do a little bit more of that. But I got to tell you, there are some of us that can go down that rabbit hole and we'll never find our way out. Never find our way out. You know, the heart of man is deep. Scripture proclaims it to be unknowable by all except for God. You know, we're, we're just not all that great at examining ourselves. We're only so good at it. So here's the last thing. The last thing is this. Judging ourselves should not be a major occupation. Can I say? because I need it. Do you hear this? Paul says, therefore there is one who, who examines me, and he's the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. Notice that. Do not go on passing judgment. Notice he says, I'm not aware of anything against myself. In other words, he's, he's not talking about just sinning randomly and not paying any attention to yourself at all. He's warning us about the danger of going down this trail of over-introspection about everything within ourselves. Listen, there's stuff that's obvious. When you sin, you know you've sinned. The Holy Spirit is able to convict you. You should be aware of this. There should be a, there's a time set aside for examining yourself during communion, and there's, there's these important things that we should do. In the end, you can't live your life doing this. You've got to be able to move on from this. For some of us, this is a word of freedom that needs to be spoken by the Holy Spirit to our hearts. My brothers and sisters, we, we have to be delivered from the obsessive spirit of self-examination and self-judgment that is a satanic attempt to bring us under a place of powerlessness because we are self-condemned always. Some of us are incapable of being used by God because we are never good enough to be used by God. And the only person who's saying that is me, myself, and I. God would point you to Calvary and say there is one who atoned for your sins and they have been, they have been dealt with by the blood of Jesus Christ. So stop holding yourself accountable for that which he died to set you free from. Be careful, you're going to give people a license to sin. I'm going to tell you this. I 100% have come to the conclusion that the more we understand the cross of Jesus and the freedom that we have because of what he's done for us, the more the desire for sin will seep right out of us and we'll live wholly by accident. But that those who are living by the standard of self-examination will find themselves always tempted and always struggling because it's always before them the sin that must be overcome, the sin that must be overcome, and the fear that comes from the sin that we must protect ourselves from and our spouses from and our children from and everybody around us from and, and the obsessive need to judge what Christ died to just set us free from to set us free from, I got to tell you, it is both the scariest and the, and the joyous, the, the, the most joyous place to live. 
When he said that he came to set us free, I mean to tell you he came to set us free. And he that is free is free indeed. It's a scary freedom. It's a powerful freedom. It's an outrageous freedom. And it's a holy freedom because it's inspired by the life of God's spirit within us making Jesus real to us. Man, how it sets you free for the Holy Spirit to tap you on the heart and say, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh. And for him also to say, would you just stop looking at yourself long enough and live life for me? Amen? My brothers and sisters, if you're here and you struggle with a constant weight of self-condemnation, my prayer this morning is that the gospel of Jesus Christ will set you free. It will set you free. Set me free. To be who we are in Christ. Live it honestly before him. Amen? Be careful how you judge. Be careful how you judge. There's one who judges. Boy, is he qualified to do it. Let him do it. Let the job be his. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, there are so many implications of what we've looked at this morning. It runs so deep in us. If Satan can't use our worst intentions against us, he'll use our most holy and our best intentions against us. Keep us bound in guilt and shame and fear self-preservation, protection. Lord, you've come that we might have freedom in Christ. It's not licentiousness to sin. But you've come to set men's hearts free. Free from the sin that binds us, but free from the self that is such a hard shell for so many of us. A hard shell to crack through. The self-righteousness that is part of self-condemnation the ways that we grit our teeth and in our own strength try to do better. Lord, you've called us to a life of peace and freedom in Christ. So help us to live in light of the fact that you are the judge. My request is is that by the power of your spirit, you would help me to be trustworthy and faithful. It's my desire. You've given me some talents that I will be accountable for the use of someday, but there's some things I'm not talented with. And Lord, you're the only one who knows how to judge and measure what I am, what I'm not. You're the only one Lord, I want to love people enough to live caring about where they're at so that I don't step on their toes, offend. But I don't want to be governed by, this, by the fear of man that is a snare and a bondage. Lord, I pray that in that desire to walk faithfully and truthfully before you, trustworthy, Lord, that we would remember that there is one who is the judge, that we will answer to you, so we take our lives seriously. But in the end, we live in the light that we have, we endeavor to serve you faithfully, and we let the judgment belong to you, Silence, Lord, if I can pray this way. I ask that there would be someone in here that this is a day, one of those stake-in-the-ground days where the voice of the accuser is put a stop to where that 
weight of guilt and shame that has followed around from the past would be broken, the power of it would be broken by the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would set someone free today. Lord, we may have times of battling this. These are deeply ingrained issues for us, but I pray that today would be that day we drive the stake and we say, I will no longer live focused on myself, but I will set my eyes on the one who gave himself for me, and I will live joyfully, lovingly, gratefully for him who gave himself for me. And I pray that that orientation, that motivation would change in our hearts so that we're not driven by guilt and shame anymore, the need to perform obsessively, but that out of joyfulness and gratitude for what you've done, we live obediently and faithfully to the one who gave himself for us. I pray that you'd begin a, a time of healing for some of us today. Let the power of this truth be life-changing for someone. Lord, I pray that you would come to us in your grace and in your mercy that we sang about this morning, reminding ourselves that steadfast love never ceases, that mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. That we would cast ourselves upon your mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, for what you've done. Minister that truth to our hearts. And Lord, may we become vehicles of grace to one another, vehicles of, of hope and restoration to one another. Give us honest and sincere hearts before you to serve you faithfully. And then help us to trust in what you have done to free us. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.